who's welcomes Kanawha County Commissioner Ben Salango, the Democratic nominee for governor. Commissioner, we're glad you could join us today. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, also with us today will be our senior political writer, Charles Young, and publisher, Andy Nicely. I'm John Miller, the executive editor. You know, before we dive into questions, Commissioner, how about you give us a little brief background of yourself? Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben Salango. I'm the Democratic nominee for governor. And, you know, I got into this race about a year ago in, uh, in October. It was about October 10th or so that I got in because I truly believe that we need new leadership. You know, the state of West Virginia needs somebody that's going to show up for work every single day, show up on time, you know, work hard and get things done. That's what I've done in my, my entire life. I grew up in southern West Virginia. My folks raised me, uh, you know, in a, in a little two-bedroom trailer down there. We started a small business, and I saw them work night and day to make it a success. That's, that's who I am. That's, that's my background. I went to um, WVU. Uh, then WVU Law School. And then after that, I started practicing law and uh, I practiced law for 22 years. I'm also a Kanawha County Commissioner, you know, making sure that uh, I'm out uh, every day, you know, uh, doing with economic development, working hard to bring in new, uh, new jobs, new industries, trying to diversify our economy, working hard with our health department to uh, combat COVID-19 and uh, just making sure that we're putting the people first. That's something I've done as a lawyer. That's something I've done as a commissioner. That's something that I'll do as governor. West Virginia needs a governor who actually wants this job. Somebody who is, uh, is not gonna use the job for his own personal gain. You know, one of the things that we've seen from the beginning is that Jim Justice is using his position to give himself tax benefits, to get rid of uh, back taxes for his company and using it to promote his own business. We need a governor who's about the people, somebody who's gonna stand up for all West Virginians and not just promote his own business. That's why I got in the race. That's why I'm running. We need somebody that's gonna focus on education, who's gonna focus on our economy, who's gonna focus on fixing our roads and our bridges, who's really going to be honest with the public about COVID-19 and not constantly change the maps and change the collars you know, for uh, his own political advantage someone who's going to be trustworthy and honest to the people. Uh, I, you know, I, I was, uh, I've traveled all over the state of West Virginia. I've been in North Central West Virginia uh, at least a dozen times since I started the race. And, and I'm listening to people. We've put out our plans based upon input from folks all over the state of West Virginia. Uh, you can check out our plans on bensalango.com. Well, Ben, let's dive into some of those issues that you mentioned. And, and obviously, I think the one that's got everybody's attention right now is kind of one that, that morphs between uh, health care and, and education, and that's the COVID-19 response. You've questioned the COVID-19 response in regards to the back-to-school map. How would you approach, approach the situation differently? You know, one of the things that I want to say, you know, first and foremost, I think we need to be using the Harvard map as a guideline. I don't think that it, we need to be shutting our economy down. Our economy will not survive if we shut down again. So one of the things I would have done differently compared to the governor, I would have made sure that we had a mask mandate. What this governor did was he put politics ahead of public health. When COVID started, the governor actually started doing political polls to see what was in his best, his best political interest, not what was best for the state of West Virginia and its people. He was actually polling to see you know, which way he should go to make policy. That's not the way that you run the state, particularly during a health pandemic. And so I would have made sure there was a mask mandate. I would have made sure that we were spending our $1.25 billion, getting it out there to save our small businesses. You know, we've had dozens and dozens of businesses close all over West Virginia, and the governor's still sitting on a billion dollars. Uh, only $250 million of that $1.25 billion has been spent. He's not getting it out there to the people who need it the most. Uh, you know, he set up a small business program. He said he was going to allocate $150 million to help our businesses. $22 million went out uh, last I saw. And then he, shut the, uh, then he shut the program down. So we need a governor who's actually going to focus on getting our uh, economy back into shape, using that billion dollars, uh, making sure that our schools are safe. You know, we came out with a plan early on for uh, safe reentry of schools, and the governor, you know, referred to it as, uh, 
he, he said that the teachers who worked on the plan and, and me, he referred to us as ignorant. He didn't take any of the proposals that we put out there to make sure that the money was going out into our schools to make them safe so that we could get back in school, you know, in person, uh, where the teachers, the school service personnel, the students and the parents all felt safe. So we need a governor who's actually going to listen to the experts, not take political polls and try to determine what's most advantageous to him. Uh, that's what I would have done differently. I would have listened to the experts. I would have made sure that we were out there every day, uh, you know, spending that money, getting it out to the people who need it the most. I would have made sure that we weren't adjusting the map just for re-election. You know, it's amazing to me that if you track over the last 30 days, the active cases in West Virginia, not total cases, just the active cases, has gone up 46 percent. Yet our map gets greener every day. And so it just doesn't make sense. You know, if you compare what's going on with the Harvard map and then compare it to, to Jim Justice's adjusted political map, it's two different things. People need to be told the truth. And if your county is orange or your county is red, you shouldn't be told that everything's fine, that's green and yellow. You know, I think people need to be uh, told the truth so that they can adjust accordingly. Parents rely upon that map to determine whether or not they're going to pick virtual education or in-person education uh, with respect to those counties that uh, offer the option. And the governor needs to be honest with them. He needs to quit playing politics with people's health. Commissioner, let's go back because uh, and we are going to touch on a number of topics. So uh, I want to go back to the map. And, and you said we should follow the Harvard model and listen to the health experts. So I want to I want to hear how you would balance that when the, the West Virginia Department of Education surveys indicated that I think it was as high as 79 percent. But I know it was well over 70 percent of residents want students in school. Absolutely. As do I. I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad. I have a 13 year old and an 18 year old. Uh, I want to get them off the PlayStation and get them in school for sure. Uh, but I think that you use the Harvard map as a guide. One of the things that I've advocated for from the beginning was local control. You know, it's, it's the folks in the county health department. It's the superintendents. It's the school boards. They know what's going on in their communities. The governor trying to manage all 55 counties doesn't have the inside knowledge that they have. So I've suggested that the Harvard map be used as a guideline, not as a, a end all be all, and th that they use that to determine whether or not they uh, close school for the entire county if there is community spread. But what I really think they should do is use the map and use their knowledge combined with what's going on with the health department to determine which schools need to be shut down if there's an outbreak. Uh, the governor, you know, should have been out, should have delegated local control from the beginning. And, you know, that would have helped us get back into in-person school and get our kids back on the football fields, back on the soccer fields earlier on. Instead, he thought it was going to be easy. He thought that because, you know, West Virginia is socially distant by nature that and we were doing very well in the beginning, that he was going to come in. He was going to play king with the money. He was going to play king with the map and he was going to be able to manage this problem. Turns out it doesn't work like that. You know, you've got to you've got to listen to the experts. You've got to make sure that you have people who are actually on the front lines making decisions and helping with the decisions. He didn't do that. He tried to play king. And now we're paying the price for it. I think there were 21 schools shut down yesterday. I haven't checked the number today, but I suspect there'll be more. Well, OK, so the Harvard model, you're saying the Harvard model with no tweaks. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's what many states are doing. If you look over at, at Kentucky, which the governor has continuously praised, they're relying upon the Harvard model, but they're giving local control to the counties. You know, you shouldn't have three different maps. It doesn't make sense. It's confusing to parents. It's confusing for educators. Have one map and, and you know, respect the science that went into the Harvard map. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to follow Harvard's recommendations when they say if something's orange that you have to shut down all businesses in the county, whatever it may be. I think you use the Harvard map as a guideline so that we're all playing with the same set of rules, the same set of guidelines, and you're not using three different maps and, confu and confusing people. Okay. Um, you've, you touched on this a little bit, but I want to go back to the CARES Act money, and, and you've questioned that. You said you would get more money out to businesses. Uh, you've mentioned small businesses in particular. The governor's plan appears to put back about 33% of the money, I believe $400 million, 
for unemployment payments if needed. Do you disagree with that part of the plan? Yes. In fact, you started off saying $700 million, and I know that he's adjusted that. You know, my, my thought is get the money out there and keep people employed, what, you know, instead of holding it all back and waiting for there to be unemployment. You know, if what he's saying is true, that West Virginia's on a rocket ship ride, that we're the best in everything now, that we went from 50th to 1st, why do you need $400 million reserved for unemployment? Uh, you know, th th there's, a, there's a big discrepancy with what the governor tells us and what he does. You know, the truth is we're not on a rocket ship ride. The truth is we're having businesses close every single day. And the governor had no plan. His one-size-fits-all approach to his uh, small business plan was ridiculous. Everybody, you know, any business between one and 35 employees, everybody gets $5,000. You know, a, a company that has 35 employees, $5,000 doesn't go very far. So there should have been a scaled approach based upon either uh, the, the number of employees you have or payroll, something to that effect, rather than this one size fits all, uh, you know, it was a lazy approach. It was, it, there's no creativity. He did a one size fits all approach just to get the money out there, just so he could say he did something. And the fact is it was a failure. Okay, so along that line, how would you, how would you implement that though in government? I mean, what, what state department would oversee that type of program and make well, you those could do it, You could do it through the Commerce Department. I would let the auditor uh, handle it. You could do it a, a number of different ways, exactly the way the federal government did the payroll protection plan. And I understand they went through the banks to administer it, but you know the uh, you you base it upon something other than you know just saying that everybody gets the same amount, one to thirty five employees. You know, there, there were ways to handle it. You could do, have done it through a website. You could have done it through commerce. Lots of ways to handle it. But the, the one thing you don't do is treat a company with one employee the same that you would treat a company with 35 employees and give them all $5,000. That's not the way to do it. John, if I can, if I sure. can. Um, Commissioner, I absolutely agree that we have a lot of small businesses closing daily. Um, and, and, COVID-19 certainly put a stress on that as people stay home and do a lot more internet shopping than they do shopping at our main street stores. Do you have any specific ideas on how to help the small business community and help, help it recover? Yeah, the only way that you're gonna be able to do that is with an influx, with a cash infusion. Uh, and that has to be, we need to go back and redo our, our CARES Act small business program. Keep in mind that when that money was setting in the, in the account for over 60 days, and I'm seeing businesses close all over West Virginia, but I was seeing it in particular in, in my county where I'm the commissioner, I'm seeing small businesses close. I sent the governor a letter and because when the federal CARES Act money was appropriated, 45% was supposed to go to county and municipal government. So we could do our own programs, 45% of it, which would have been around $550 million or so dollars. He didn't do that. He kept all of it for himself. So I sent him a letter and said, Governor, we've got small businesses closing every day in Kanawha County. At least give the county $10 million so we can allocate it to our small businesses. I have small business programs that I've created here in Kanawha County. You know, we could have done something very similar with coming up with a board to oversee the, the administration of the grants. He wouldn't, he didn't do that. You know, he criticized even me asking for the money came out and said that it was, it should have been sent on Solango campaign letterhead. And then he didn't do anything. He came out with a, with an approach that doesn't work. So we've got to make sure that we are getting the rest of that money out at least at a minimum up to the $150 million that he committed. But I would suggest to you, it's going to take more than that. You know, we've got restaurants that are still operating at 25 to 50% capacity. That's not even meeting their overhead. We've got to make sure that we're supporting our restaurants, our small businesses, and others. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, you've talked about pay raises for teachers and school personnel and public employees. We're going to kind of move into our education segment here. Um, let's talk about that. How would you pay for that? Well, the first thing that I would do is make sure that we call a special session to focus on education. 
you know, the governor has done a number of corporate giveaways. The legislature uh, implemented another corporate, a number of corporate giveaways. Rather, it was the severance tax uh, cut, which the governor campaigned against, by the way, in 2016. He said, if you cut severance tax, it won't create any more jobs. And turns out it didn't. We have fewer coal jobs now than we did in 2016. Uh, they gave a corporate giveaway for if you buy a private jet in West Virginia, you don't have to pay sales tax. Those are the types of giveaways that I would stop. Make sure that we're using that money to get it out to our teachers, you know, our best and our brightest. We've got to keep them here. We've got to retain the teachers. We've got to be competitive with the states around us. You know, in the Eastern Panhandle, a teacher can just cross the state boundary and make $15,000 more, you know, with a 10 minute drive. We've got to be competitive with other states if we're going to keep our teachers, if we're going to make sure that when college kids register for college and they want to check you know, education as their major, teaching as their major, we got to give them the incentive to do that. But when other professions are paying so much more, they're not going to do it. And so we got to make sure that we're keeping our best and our brightest. We need to call a special session and come up with the money uh, to make sure that we're paying our teachers and our school service personnel appropriately. You know, uh, a, a cook, for instance, can work 10 years in, in, uh, in a school and still be below the poverty line. After a decade, of working for a school and be below the poverty line, we've got to fix that. You know, no one should be working a 40 hour week, 50 hour week and be below the poverty line, you know, especially, you know, our school service personnel. So we've got to fix that. We've got to call a special session and really crunch down and, and find the money to give our teachers and our school service personnel uh, raises. Along those same lines, uh, Commissioner, um, you know, many of those same state employees have had recent five to 10 percent pay raises. And uh, especially after the second time, we heard a good bit of feedback from people in other industries. And yes, there, there's no doubt we're not going to argue the point that teachers and, and education personnel trail surrounding states. But all you have to do is look at the per capita income. You can say that about pretty much every job in the mountain state. So for the rest of the taxpaying public, how do you address those concerns? Well, you know, as governor, you can't really affect what, uh, what a, the boss of a private company does. I mean, you know, my goal is to raise income all over West Virginia by bringing in new industry, by creating good paying jobs. You know, a, a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, but what the governor can do specifically is bring in the legislature and help those public employees. And when you say that, you know, they got a five to 10 percent raise. Uh, that raise wasn't just gifted to them. I mean, the teachers fought for that raise. They 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 had to strike for that raise, you know, and, and then it's still no fix on PEIA. There's no guarantee permanent funding source for PEIA. So the goal is to make sure that we're, we're uh, increasing wages and salaries all over West Virginia uh, by bringing in new industry, good paying jobs and being competitive. Well, let's cut to the chase. Would you support tax hikes to pay public employees and teachers more? I, I am not in support of tax hikes. Uh, I, am, I am in support of spending our tax dollars more wisely. No corporate giveaways, no, no fraud, abuse, waste, you know, giving away money to uh, his personal lobbyist. I wouldn't have done that. Uh, but I, I think we need to make sure that we're spending our tax dollars more wisely. There's only two, there's, there's two ways to do it. You either uh, make sure that you're spending tax dollars more wisely and lower the amount you're putting out, or you have to increase revenue. If you increase revenue, you do it one of two ways. You either raise taxes, which I'm against, 100% against, or you bring in new business, new industry, new development that can actually help with new revenue. That's what I'm in favor of. Spending our money wisely and bringing in new industry, new revenue by uh, additional sources. So, so in January, if elected and inaugurated in January, Governor Salango will call for a special session, but no new tax hikes will be signed by the governor. Is that correct? I am not against, uh, or I am not in favor of new taxes, you know, and that's the difference between Jim Justice and I, you know, here he is, he went around, he, he doesn't pay his taxes. He reached a secret tax deal. He owes over $204,000 just in Raleigh County in, in back property taxes. And in 2017, he proposed one of the largest tax hikes in West Virginia history, and the legislature voted it down. And so I'm not in favor of tax hikes. What I am in favor of is making sure that we're, we're spending our dollars wisely 
and making sure that we're treating our educators and our school service personnel fairly and competing with surrounding states. Uh, we've got to make sure that we have our best and our brightest educating our children. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, so, so we're against tax hikes. Uh, we are in favor of trying to increase funding for education, which I think everybody would agree with. Um, but so if you're elected, what's the future of economic development look like in West Virginia? I think we have to develop our state regionally. You know, each each area of the state is so different. I mean, I'm, when I'm in north central West Virginia and I'm looking at all the opportunities with aerospace and tech and uh, Department of Defense money and, you know, federal dollars, those types of things, that's that's very different than other parts of the state. I mean, you can't it would be it would be tough. It would be, you know, there's an infrastructure challenge to do that in southern West Virginia. And so I came up with a regional economic development plan that focuses on what each area of the state does best. And, you know, there are things we can do in southern West Virginia with regard to tourism, with regard to the Hobart Mine Project, uh, trying to develop those areas. Uh, things we can do in north central to promote our aerospace, promote our tech. Uh, Eastern Panhandle is completely different. And then, and then the northern Panhandle is different. You know, you've got Weirton, which is 20 miles away from the Pittsburgh International Airport with rail access, river access. You know, we can develop that for manufacturing make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to, to support the cracker plant that's over in Pennsylvania. Uh, so you've got to look at it from a regional approach. That's why I've been an advocate of dividing the Department of Commerce up into regions where they can work with local businesses, they can work with local elected officials and actually, uh, and actually develop that way. That's, that's the only way to develop West Virginia. You can't run a one size fits all approach and expect to get uh, results in West Virginia. Let's go through a couple sectors and tell us how you would uh, promote or move past some of these. So let's, let's talk green energy. I'm in favor of all forms of energy. Uh, that, that is not to say that I'll ever turn my back on coal miners because I won't. I mean, I was one of the first members of my family not to go underground. You know, I grew up, my family, all coal miners. Um, but I think we need to expand you know, what we're doing. I'm in favor of uh, natural gas. Uh, I'm in favor of solar. I'm in favor of wind. Anything we can do to bring in jobs. Uh, but I'll never, ever turn my back on our coal miners. You know, they built this state. They built this nation. Uh, but the, the fact is, you know, we've seen a number of studies that say that coal mining is going to, you know, we've got 25 years left at best. Uh, those aren't my studies. Those aren't my opinions. You know, those are independent studies. Uh, so we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're supporting our coal miners and for, the, for as long as that industry will survive. And I'll do nothing to kill the industry. I want to make sure that we're promoting it. But we also have to promote the other industries. You know, I was very disappointed that the governor let the Brook County power plant die, that they were uh, trying to force it. You know, it was going to be a natural gas facility that there was a that they bickered over whether it would be gas or coal. And eventually, you know, it ended. Uh, I was in favor of it. Brook County needed that development. Uh, so I'm in favor of all forms of energy. Uh, I think that's how you create good paying jobs, you know, do all we can to, to promote that. John, if I can, uh, on the Brook County power plant, the gas fired power plant, and quite honestly, um, in this discussion, what's being left out is the Harrison County gas fired power plant. Neither you nor the governor, either one, have talked about that when we've we've had big hopes for that development here. So please, you know, <clears throat> include the Harrison County power plant in that discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the more gas fired power plants we have in West Virginia, the more jobs we're going to create. You know, I, I, sp I point specifically to the Brook County because it, we were so close and the governor killed it. I mean, you know, it was it was there and the governor would not support it. And then when he realized it was, you know, to his political advantage to say that he was supporting it, which we all knew he wasn't going to, you know, he said it. But then it ended up uh, not happening. So absolutely. I, I'm familiar with the Harrison County uh, gas fired power plant discussions. I support that as well. I think those are good paying jobs. Uh, we've got to bring those to West Virginia. Yeah. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't those? 
the same developers for both of those projects? They are the same developers, uh, but there are different investors, I guess, for each one. Um, the brick was uh, up against a tighter time frame, although the Harrison County time frame in talking with some of the local uh, folks who have organized uh, on the local level, there is a, a deadline at the end of this year in regards to the lease on the property that could be extended by the local ownership, which is the county commission. Uh, but there's only about 17 months left, I believe, on the uh, PGAM or PJM agreement. So, again, um, to move that type of project along, you know, doesn't usually happen in a month or two, month or two, as we've seen. So it certainly can't wait until next summer, I think, uh, before action starts uh, heating up. Uh, let's talk a little bit. You mentioned aerospace. Uh, obviously, aerospace technology. Uh, I, I think there's a belief in some uh, that the technology sectors don't get uh, enough state support. What's your thoughts on that? I agree. And, and I've, I've been to, uh, to Fairmont and Clarksburg a number of times. I've met with those business owners and, and they agree with you. You know, I've been into Morgantown, met with those business owners. They agree with you. And uh, we've got to make sure that we are doing everything we can to promote those industries. Those are great paying jobs. Those are, you know, that, that, you know that's how you keep your, your college educated kids here, you know, and stop the brain drain. Uh, all of those jobs are uh, incredibly important to West Virginia. You know, we, we've seen some development here in the Kanawha Valley uh, over at the South Charleston Tech Park. I've been involved in those developments with N3 and others uh, with the Marshall Flight School, you know, coming into Yeager Airport. So, you know, we've got to make sure that we're doing all we can with the uh, aerospace uh, industry, the tech industry. And also, you know, as much of the, uh, the cybersecurity and those types of jobs as well. Uh, th that's big. And, and you can basically do those from West Virginia and work with companies all over the world. That's, that's incredibly important. And they're good paying jobs. Uh, thoughts on um, the effort uh, that's been launched here of late, especially with the COVID. But what are your thoughts on, I've heard it called different things, remote work programs, work from home programs. Uh, attracting people that might work for Lockheed Martin or different companies. I, I mentioned that because I know somebody who's an engineer for Lockheed Martin that does work around the world and lives in Spain uh, and lived in Florida beforehand, but was from West Virginia. He could easily, maybe if there's a incentive, come back to West Virginia and work for Lockheed Martin. Um, what's your thoughts along those lines? Is that a future for West Virginia? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, a, it's something that we've got to focus on. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is broadband and, and connectivity. So we've got to fix those issues. But, you know, m my plan is to market West Virginia, you know, work in the city, but live in paradise. People would lo people love West Virginia. You know, they come here to visit and they don't want to leave. There's so much to do. They love the hiking. They love the outdoors. Um, it's cheap to live here. It's, re it's relatively inexpensive. So you could work in New York City and live in West Virginia for a, uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar. So we've got to make sure that we're promoting that. I think that's a way to de to stop our population decline, uh, to, to make sure that we have as many people here working remotely as possible. But you've got to focus on broadband. You've got to focus on connectivity to give people that option. But we have to promote that, particularly right now. I mean, people are looking to get out of the big cities. Um, you know, I, I know that there have been some studies. I think there was one published last week that addressed that issue you know, and, and trying to recruit people from big cities to live here and, and work wherever they want in the world. But we've got to have connectivity before we can do that. You know, uh, you've touched on this a little bit. Our final direct question, there may be a couple follow-ups from the panel, um, but you've touched on this a little bit. I didn't feel like in the, in the debate it came out very well, so I want to give you an opportunity. As a county commissioner in Kanawha County, you clearly know a lot about that uh, county, and the, it, which is the state's largest county, and, and you seem to know a lot about southern West Virginia because that's where you grew up. But you've mentioned some areas of north central West Virginia. Can you can you give us an idea what you see as the pros and cons of the area and what you think we can build on? Um, oh, I think, go, absolutely. Go and now, keep in mind, I lived in Morgantown for a long time. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I went to undergrad there. I graduated uh, WVU in three years. 
Then I went to law school, lived there. Then I came back uh, when my wife went to law school. We moved back to Morgantown. Uh, so I lived, I mean, I've lived in North Central West Virginia, up in Morgantown for, you know, 11 years. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the area. And so, uh, you know, I think we need to focus on what you guys do best. It's a, I think it's highly, it's an educated area. Uh, it's, it's a hard working area. You've got a lot of great people up there and uh, we need to focus on uh, industries of the future. We've got to focus on tech. We've got to focus on robotics. You know, we've got to make sure there are opportunities there, even for the kids that aren't going to college. We've got to make sure that we're strengthening our vocation, our technical programs uh, in North Central West Virginia so that when they come out of high school, you know, they are trained and ready to work so they don't have to go to Pittsburgh or Columbus or Charlotte. You know, we want to make sure that we're keeping them here. But uh, North Central West Virginia is an economic driver for, what, for the state. Uh, much like the Eastern Panhandle is. And we've got to do all we can to support those areas, make sure that we're providing uh, uh, money in, you know, back. Uh, I hear a lot of times when I'm up there, they think the money flows one way. You know, it's coming from there to Charleston and then from Charleston, it's, it's essentially wasted. We've got to make sure that we're reinvesting in North Central West Virginia, in infrastructure, in broadband, uh, you know, in economic development. We've got to do those things. Uh, Commissioner, I, I really appreciate that answer and, and your time today. I'm going to ask the panel if they have any follow-up questions at this time. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to ask you, Commissioner, about your stance on uh, medical and recreational cannabis. That you know We have this fledgling program that's starting to get going now, but it's very limited. It's very watered down. Do you it think is. that's something that we should be pursuing more aggressively as an economic development strategy? I mean, we have an opportunity to be the Colorado of the East Coast, but it doesn't seem like we're pursuing that. No, and I, I hate that our medical cannabis is bogged down with so much red tape, and it seems like it's it's all political. Uh, you know, as a commissioner, we passed the, uh, and each county had to either opt in or opt out for the licensure part. We, we were one of the first to, to opt in. I strongly support medical cannabis. Recreational cannabis, I'm, up, I'm open to the idea there's one issue that is concerning me, and that's when I'm studying other states, including Colorado, who've enacted uh, full legalization of uh, cannabis. There have been an increase in traffic accidents, not necessarily traffic fatalities, but traffic accidents. There is no roadside test yet. There will be, but no roadside test yet to determine whether someone's operating under the influence of uh, cannabis. So, you know, if somebody's pulled over for drinking and driving, they can do a breathalyzer test. There's no roadside test yet. That's why law enforcement hasn't come out and said that they're okay with full legalization. I'm open to the idea. I know that those roadside tests are in the works. I don't think it will be long before we have them. Uh, that's going to be a tremendous source of revenue to West Virginia. Uh, it will also, you know, some studies suggest it will also help those with uh, significant um, uh, drug addiction. You know, if somebody's you know, addicted to heroin or some of the, what I call the harder drugs, you know, that, that it will help with that as well. So uh, I'm all on board for medical cannabis. I've, you know, established that record here as a commissioner. Uh, I am certainly open to full legalization, but I don't want to comp compromise public safety. Sure. Thank you, sir. John, I, I, the follow-up that I'd like to ask is, is, um, um, Commissioner, I'm, I'm originally from Nitro, and you okay. guys you guys have done a uh, tremendous job at the county commission building this, I'm going to call it a regional uh, park at Shawnee uh, in place of the golf course. Yeah. Can you walk us through a little bit about how that went from, from you know, concept to, you know, final implementation and the impact? Because I think that's a really good example of economic development. Well, and, you know, I'm very proud of that uh, sports complex that, you know, the governor criticizes me for it. He pretends like that's the only thing I've done. It's one thing I've done, but certainly not the only thing. Uh, I was appointed the county commission on February 2nd, 2017, uh, around 7 p.m. Uh, the following morning, I sent out an email asking whether there had better, ever been a study on developing uh, a, a sports complex for sports tourism. 
it turns out there had been. There had been one 20 years ago and there had been one five years ago, both urging that we do it, but none was followed up on. And so I started uh, down that, that uh, track of developing sports tourism. We had 127 acres the county owned. It was relatively flat. It was a, a nine-hole golf course that was losing about $100,000 a year. And so we looked at developing that into a, a, a multi-sport complex, and we did it. I mean, I broke, uh, we had over 50 public hearings, received the input of the community as to, you know, what they wanted to see, what they wanted. We broke ground later that year in December of 17, and I cut the ribbon in July of 2018. And it's been an economic engine here. You know, it, it brings in between 40 and $50 million of economic impact every year and helps the entire valley. It's not just Kanawha County, but the entire valley. I mean, we brought in a tournament last year, and unfortunately, you know, the tournaments were canceled this year because of COVID. But last year, we brought in a tournament that sold out 46 hotels. You know, not, not hotel rooms, hotels. Uh, everything within a two-hour radius was sold out. So it's, it's been a great project here. I think we can do more of it elsewhere. Any type of tourism we can develop, you know, it's a, uh, it's a good return on the investment. And it's also good for the kids. I mean, there were a lot of kids that, you know, didn't have places to practice, didn't have places to play. And so we run about 16 to 18 tournaments a year there, uh, travel tournaments that are usually two to three days each. And then the rest of the time it's used by the local community. I mean, the high schools use it, the middle schools. Uh, we've had everything from uh, an adult soccer league now that has around 600 members, uh, flag football, uh, baseball, softball leagues. Uh, you know, we've got basketball courts. So it, it was a, uh, you know, I think it's been well received in the community. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, I did not name a road after myself. Let me throw that out there too. You know, when, when we developed the sports complex, Metro 911 needed an address. And so the co-commissioners, Hoppy Shores and Kent Carper, named the driveway Salango Way. There is no sign that says Salango Way. They named the driveway Salango Way. Um, I didn't know about it until after they did it. I mean, I was obviously humbled by it and, and a little bit embarrassed, but there's no road that, that's named Salango Way. That's, that's a fake end. Well, Commissioner, I wasn't going to ask you that. I was going to ask you if you're playing the Adult Soccer League. Because in Reader, <laughs> Ohio, I, I know you've been involved with coaching soccer and baseball down there. Yeah, I coach uh, youth soccer. I actually never played soccer. I was a wrestler, and uh, I played football. I played running back in high school and a uh, baseball player in high school as well. But, no, I, I never played soccer. So I, I had a little team, uh, the Sharks, that I coached for about six or seven years. Well, Commissioner, we're going to give you a couple minutes to uh, wrap up and tell the people of West Virginia why you deserve their vote to be the next governor of this great state. Well, you know what? I, I appreciate the opportunity. And, and West Virginia needs new leadership. We need a governor who's going to come to work and work hard every single day for all of West Virginia. Somebody who actually wants this job and not just the fancy title and the perks. That's what I've demonstrated my entire career as a lawyer, as a, as a commissioner, that I will get things done. I'll show up for work. I'll work for the people and make things happen. Uh, that's what we need as governor. We need somebody who's going to make things happen, not just show up around election time and try to pave a bunch of roads and try to do as much as possible, you know, 60 days before an election. We need somebody who's working all the time for the entire four year four term. Year term. If you do that, you know what? You're going to see incredible results. If you have somebody that's working hard, somebody that you can be proud of, Somebody, when you go to bed at night, you're not questioning whether or not they're working for you or working for themselves. You know, that's how you move West Virginia forward. That's what I'll do as governor. That's why I decided to run. I want to create opportunities here. I want to make sure that my kids, my 13-year-old, my 18-year-old uh, kids, they, want, they have opportunities to stay here. Make sure that your kids and your grandkids have opportunities to stay here. We can do that if we have a governor who's focused on public service rather than self-service. Commissioner, Commissioner, we thank you for your time today and, uh, and good luck uh, with this election and in the future. And uh, uh, let's encourage everyone to get out and vote. All right. Thank you all so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Take sir. Bye-bye.